ekranları başındaki değerli izleyicilerimiz. Hepinize merhaba. Moderatörlüğünü sevgili arkadaşım Profesör Doktor Abdati ile birlikte gerçekleştirdiğimiz bu programımızın yine e, çok değerli bir konu ve çok da güzel bir konumuz var. E, bugün Brezilya Minas Gerais Federal Üniversitesi Biyoloji Bilimler Enstitüsü'nden Profesör Lizia Valentina Modolo bizlerle birlikte olacak. Konumuzsa bitkilerden elde edilen bileşiklerin tıbbi amaçlarla entegrasyonu. Evet, konuğumu sizlere kısaca tanıtmak istiyorum. Ziya Valentina Modolo'nun BA derecesi var. Brezilya Campinas Devlet Üniversitesi'nden kimya alanında 2000 yılında yüksek lisansını ve 2004 yılında da fonksiyonel ve moleküler biyoloji alanında doktorasını tamamlıyor. Doktor Modolo, Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nin Oklahoma kentindeki Noble Araştırma Enstitüsü'nde doktora sonrası araştırmalarına devam ediyor. Hala Minas Gerais Federal Üniversitesi'nde botanik bölümünde doçent olarak görev yapmakta. Prof. Modolo yeni riyaz inhibitörlerinin geliştirilmesi ağının koordinatörüdür. Araştırma alanları arasında bitki beslenmesi, ikinci metabolizma ve bitki dokularında çevresel stresin tetiklediği dünyal süreçleri yer almakta. 75'in üzerinde hakemli makalesi yayınlanmıştır ve 23 kitap bölümü 8 patenti bulunmakta. CRC Press, Springer Nature ve Elsever tarafından yayınlanan 3 kitabında editörlüğünü yapmıştır. Ve bu kitaplarından birisi de Birezil Yaş Bağlı Bitkileri ile ilgili. Haş indeksi ise Modolo'nun 28. Evet, e, hello dear Modolo. Hello, Sefula. Thank you very much for joining our program. It's my pleasure. Uh, I will now leave the word to Prof. Aftarati. Thank you, uh, Sefula. And uh, I cannot say anything here with the after Sefula. <laughs> so uh, just right now, I'm happy to, to, to be with you today uh, live on YouTube. And uh, Luzia, she is uh, one of my colleagues, and uh, she is one of our editors in Journal of Advanced Research. And uh, she is well known and uh, well deserved, like a good scientist, uh, well respected scientist. So uh, you are uh, like, uh, like uh, we are happy to have you with us today, Luzia. And I will leave you now the time to you for your talk. Is Luzia. Um, thank you very much, Sefulai and Abidu. I, I think for me it's a, an honor to be today with you and uh, it's a good way to be very close to you and very far away at the same time. Thank you. Thank Let you. me just um, share the screen here. Uh, is everybody seeing my screen? Not yet, Luzia. Uh, okay. It's supposed to be shown. Can you see now? Yes, yes, it was okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm not so used to Zoom. Then I just need to know how to... Okay, put down here. The... Yes. Okay, I can get Yes, yes. Okay, then you can perfect. maximize. Okay. Um, so, um, good afternoon to people from the North Hemisphere and good uh, good morning for those in the South. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the integration of bioactive compounds sourced from plants for medicinal purpose. And uh, before I start my talk, I wanted to dedicate this seminar to Dr. Raymond Cooper, who passed away recently in 2022. He was a good friend of mine and a great researcher who worked uh, in research and development in the pharmaceutical industry and later in the dietary supplements industry and also developed new Chinese botanicals. But when we think about plants and natural products, we understand that plants generate a great variety of substances that apparently are not directly involved to the growth and development. 
Um, this substance we name uh, secondary metabolites, and they are found in very specific and limited distribution across the plant kingdom. Uh, just for a brief example, we have that those secondary metabolites come from the primary carbon metabolism. When plants capture CO2 from the atmosphere, then we'll just convert this carbon in a series of compounds, primary metabolites, that will enter in a specific pathways to generate, for example, phenolic compounds, nitrogen-containing secondary products, and terpenes, the major secondary metabolites constituents that we call natural products. And uh, they are basically these um, three structural classes that we can find here. And they uh, sometimes they overlap in terms of what a carbon skeleton is used to generate them. And we have a great variety, for example, tannins, coumarins, uh, quinones, and flavonoids, they are all belonging to the phenolic um, classes. Uh, we also have a polyketides, terpenes, that belongs to terpenoids classes, and alkaloids, that it, it's a type of and containing uh, a substance, uh, besides the cyanogenic glycosides and glucosinolates as well. And plants basically produce this plethora of the compounds, uh, as an effort to protect themselves against uh, pathogen attack, um, uh, abiotic stress, and use those compounds to attract the pollinators, for example, or uh, attract some animals to uh, uh, disperse uh, seeds and so on. And once we have access to that knowledge, we can take advantage in order to study for the human purpose, for example, beneficial uh, 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 to the health. And when we think about uh, medicines, plants as medicine, um, we have evidence that people have used plants since prehistory. For example, here we have an image on the screen in which show a 77,000-year-old 77, South African cryptocaria woody leaves. And then it was used for bedding at that period of time because this plant was very toxic to mosquitoes and then they could have a good night of sleep. And... Um, um, Chemicals were also found in a 5,000-year-old Neanderthal uh, teeth, which suggested that those people would eat some chamomile, cam uh, camellia sinensis plants. And indeed, herbal medicines have been used for millennia. Uh, over 1,000 of plant species have medicinal use. And uh, several people around the world depend on her herbal medicines to, um, as a source of a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical medicines. And when we think about the most prescribed medicines around the world, we have that more than 50% of them contains at least one compound that it is derived from plants. And then the participation of plants in human health is notable. When we think about the traditional knowledge, when people just get one plant species and use for certain purpose because it is a common knowledge, they started using that in a period of time, some empirical information, we can combine this with modern approaches to advance the research towards the production of new uh, pharmaceutical compounds. For example, we have here on the screen um, a technique like a mass spectrometry technique that can be used to identify compounds from a mixture uh, that comes from a plant extract and then get the identity of the main compounds in an effort to test them as um, a combination or 
a pure compound that can be used for treat some disease in particular. And with the, adv uh, the advance of uh, metabolic engineering in which we, you, you can just uh, genetic engineering a plant and for example, overexpress a gene that encodes certain protein that participate in a particular um, uh, pathway to generate a, a lead compound, you can basically create, generate a plant that can overproduce that amount, uh, that uh, particular compound that can be used to treat some disease. And here on the screen, we have an example of a genetic engineering towards the accumulation of some alkaloids and uh, glucosinolate and um, uh, glycosylated uh, um, compounds. Um, as for the record, when we think about ethnobotany, we find uh, records of uh, a variety of people using a uh, plant uh, for treating some disease since, since a long time ago. Uh, for example, we have here the Persian physician and philosopher Avicenna. He wrote the Book of Healing and the Canal of Medicine, circa 1000 Anno Domini. And as for North America, for example, we have here this picture that exemplifies uh, um, an Ojibwa person from this tribe preparing herbal medicine. Also, it is uh, notable the uh, participation of Sub-Saharan Africa people that works as uh, a healers in, in, in an effort to prepare traditional herbal medicines. And also uh, records in South America from uh, two Azteca people, Martin de la Cruz and Juan Badiano. They both wrote um, a manuscript called the Baudian, the Badians, a manuscript or Azteca Herbal in 1552. Uh oh. Sorry, but I think it's frozen. Okay. I think it's ready for the weekend in the middle of a week. How come? Um, so when we think about Greek herbals, they remained in use through the Middle Ages. And the records just show, for example, this manuscript from Theophrastus uh, dating uh, from 2000 BC. And this is the edition printed in 1644. It's named uh, Hist Historia Plantarum. And also this one is even older and it dates from uh, 50 uh, Anno Domini. And it's called the Materia Medica by Pedanius Dioscorides. The use of uh, terpenes from uh, Digitalis purpurea are dated from 1785, which means in the 18th century, uh, people were basically using uh, terpenoids, uh, glycosyl uh, glyco glyco glycosylated terpenoids, to um, uh, treat heart conditions. And the efforts of uh, the botanist and the geologist William Withering, um, he spent several years uh, optimizing the preparations and the doses uh, of uh, leaves of digitalis purpurea for this purpose. Uh, already in the 19th century, uh, the quest for active compounds were intensified. In 1805, for example, morphine was discovered from papaver somniferum, and it is an alkaloid. And later on in the 1820s, uh, it was recorded the discovery of a salicin from salix alba, and it is basically um, glycosylated alcohol. And also in the 1820s, the discovery of a quinine from Cinchona species. It is also um, an alkaloid. 
and the discover of this terpene named the Taxol or Paclitaxel, and most recently in 1966 from the bark of a Taxus brevifolia. But which is really better for the sake of uh, disease treatment, a plant extract or purified compounds? We have uh, both uh, pros and cons with regard to any approach. For example, when we think about um, um, uh, crude extract, um, crude extracts, they can have um, multifactorial effects which can be beneficial for the person who will take it. And it comes from a traditional knowledge and alleged to be natural and then for safer. However, we need to open a parenthesis because not, not necessarily something that is natural uh, is really safe to be consumed because it mostly depends on the uh, a quantity that it is uptaken. And um, also a plant extract, it is often uh, cheaper when compared with um, um, a purified compound. On the other hand, we can find some cons. For example, when you over harvest the, the plant, uh, the supply is gonna be short. And this is a problem because most of the times um, plants cannot really attend and uh, uh, correspond to expect expectation uh, regarding the number of people that need it. And then this is a problem. The over harvesting is a, is a problem. And also the variation batch to batch for the production, um, uh, it's, it's um, more difficult to standardize. It is possible, but it, it makes a big difficulty as well. Uh, when we think about a purified compound, we have basically a single defined compound in which I know the structure, I can test for a particular disease and uh, basically endorse its uh, use. Um, it is based on scientific knowledge and it is pure and allegedly safer. Well, also we need to be careful because we need to make the perform tests to make sure it is. And uh, for example, synthetic forms can preserve wild plants because of the over harvesting and uh, provide consistent supply. Um, we can get a precise dose because they are pure, but the, the cons is basically they are quite more expensive when compared to plant extract, especially when we think about uh, chemotherapy uh, uh, agents. And um, when we seek drugs and the therapies from traditional medicines, we can basically use the plant directly, uptake it, is in, in the form of a tea or a dye, something like that. Or you can basically use that extract, identify uh, basically the efficiency, the clinical efficiency, optimize and standardize that um, is extract and then uptake it. Uh, we also can identify the main compound uh, that is the responsible for the, 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 the desired active or mm. a fraction that is good for that. And, um, and uh, uh, go to the identification of the efficiency, optimization, and then uptake it, or go further and um, uh, register as a drug. Uh, we can also test a series of plant species that we have no idea about the, the, the composition and the, the, the function, the potential function for medicinal purpose. Do a screening for bioactivity, identifying the main compounds or uh, active fractions, and go do the standardization and then gets a new medicine or even use it as a pool of fraction to uptake. 
this is what we call bioprospecting. It's when you just um, perform a plant screening to select those compounds that can become a drug, medicine. Then we need to make extracts. We need to perform analytical um, um, tests to identify the main compounds, do biological assays and uh, clinical trials to uh, achieve the goal. Then for some examples, we have here salicin. Salicin was extracted from the bark of a salix alba and was the lead compound for the production of the synthetic one, acetosalicylic acid, it is all, uh, today used as an anti-inflammatory and painkiller. And look how very simple this molecule is and how uh, widely used for the purpose uh, as anti-inflammatory and painkiller. As for the treatment of dysentery, we have this uh, terpene, glycosylated terpene, named new andrographolite, mainly uh, obtained from andrographis paniculata. As for uh, anti hepatotoxicity agent, we have this um, um, flavonoid uh, called the silibin that it is extracted from syllable marianum. And usually it is used as a, a phytotherapy. Um, another example is uh, the caffeine, this alkaloid widely produced by Camellia sinensis and the coffee plants as well. And it is um, a central nervous system stimulant. Another central nervous system stimulant is strychnine. Uh, terpen widely produced by Strychnus nux vomica. And this one is a good example that it, depending on the amount that you uptake, it can work as a central ner nervous uh, system stimulant or can be deleterious and kill you. For the treatment of a capillary fra fragility, for example, it is widely used uh, hesperidine. It's a glycosylated flavonoid, widely distributed in, uh, distributed in citrus species. For the treatment of um, capillary fragility, SN, which it is a glycosylated terpene widely produced by Iascum hippocastanum. And morphine, a powerful narcotic analgesic, analgesic alkaloid from poppy. Uh, it, depending on the concentration, it can get you a hallucination, but in low doses administrated, basically in hospitals, can be a powerful analgesic. Then we have uh, morphine, noscapine, and codeine, and thebaine, all produced from um, papabicet. As for antimalarials, we have a both a quinine and artemisinin. And this is a very interesting example because uh, quinine has been used a long time for treating malaria, and malaria accounts for 20% uh, of a childhood death is worldwide. And uh, it is caused by a mosquito uh, transmitted a uh, plasmodium species. And uh, with the time, of course, of using this alkaloid, for example, the uh, plasmodium species started to become more resistant to this drug. And then it became the front line, this terpene, which is called artemisinin, and it is extracted from Artemisia annua, and it is the front line for the treatment of uh, malaria currently. Uh, as for the taxol paclitaxel, uh, you can see it is a very complex uh, uh, structure, a terpene, that it is very effective anti-cancer drug because it stabilizes microtubes and block cell division. It is originally extracted from taxus brevifolia, but for example, when we think about the possibility 
of uh, using uh, um, this compound, extracting from the barks of this plant species, we have a problem because this is not sustainable at all. Because once you get the bark out of the plant, the plant will die. And uh, basically you can get, get only one dose of uh, chemotherapy uh, for one patient when you do this from a, um, an adult tree. And then it's definitely not feasible. And then we most of the time need to rely on a uh, uh, synthetic approach, semi-synthetic approach or uh, cell cultures as well. Um, we also have examples of drug repositioning and the best example is the vinca alkaloids. A drug reposition is when you have a drug that it is used basically to treat some particular disease. And then you just uh, uh, do perform several uh, researches and, uh, and, and tests and find out that that particular drug can be used to treat another disease as well. This is the case, for example, of the alkaloids, the vinc alkaloids, vinblastine and vincristine, produced uh, uh, by Catharantus roseus, uh, a plant from Madagascar, native to Madagascar, which was initially used to treat diabetes. But because the plant extract was found to be toxic to white blood cells in animal models, they thought it could be a good idea to use these uh, uh, purified compounds for the treatment of cancers uh, related to white blood cells, for example, uh, lymphoma. And uh, vinca alkaloids, they basically bind to uh, the free tubulin dimers, avoiding the microtube assembling, and then arrest basically the cell cycle, uh, specifically the, the cancer cell. Um, a very good example of a tradi tra uh, traditional medicine that became and went to clinical trials is the Huang Qing Tang. And it is a mixture of herbs from China, Chinese herbs. It's a cocktail basically of scutellaria plants that uh, were found to be very effective. And then it came from the traditional Chinese medicine to the clinical trials. The main constituent of this mixture um, is uh, flavonoids. And uh, this mixture, mixture is necessary to be done in a particular way. Otherwise it's not really work and it must have all those four um, herbs uh, shown on the screen. And for the, cl the clinical trials, uh, researchers basically use the CPT11, that it is a chemotherapy agent uh, used for, for treatment of a column uh, cancer. And this one is a an alkaloid that it is derived from capitotacin, but it has several side effects in patient. And then what they observed in the clinical uh, trials when they combined CPT11 with the Huang Xing Tang 5906 formulation, uh, it basically restored the functionality of the epithelium, the intestinal epithelium, and prevented the animal's uh, death. And then basically in the 21st century, the science can be applied to Asian medicines because the advance of analytical techniques allowed us to basically identify the main compounds, know the identity and test them isolated in an effort to find a potential use. And then we can just answer several questions such as, what are the active compounds in those mixtures? What are optimal dosages to use? What biochemical pathways do they affect in the patient? Do they arrest this, the cell cycle? 
uh, or uh, basically inhibit uh, the activity of some enzyme that it is very important for the establishment of a particular disease? And what side effects can arise? Um, because of that, we have also uh, in the market what we call over-the-counter herbal medicines. It means that you can go to the drugstore. You don't need to have a prescription to buy that. And we have here some example like the, the drug, the phytotherapy, uh, Echinacea. It comes from Echinacea species. Uh, garlic, it is allium sativan. Uh, golden seal, Hydratis canadensis. The ginseng, uh, saw palmetto, uh, St. John's wort, and kava kava. And uh, we can see that mm, several people basically uh, have tried the complementary or alternative medicine such as those listed here on the screen. And uh, the, the advance of omics systems semi-synthetic methods and metabolic engineering were very critical to uh, produce uh, drugs in a more sustainable way. For example, once you know how plants produce a certain secondary metabolite, a certain natural products, you can um, uh, study the genome the transcriptome, the proteome, and the metabolome to find out the pathway that drives to the production of that particular metabolite. And then you can make biochemical approaches in which you can overexpress uh, in a specific gene in that uh, uh, pathway in order to uh, provide an accumulation of that compound in the plants plant cell in general and overall in order to get what you want in a higher amount for producing the drug. And this in an ecological context, why? Because for example, most of the time when plants are challenged with, with some type of um, uh, stress, this will boost the secondary metabolism as an effort to protect themselves in, against that uh, threat. And then we can take advantage in these conditions by stressing a system and get more of that compound. Um, we have on the screen here an example of uh, plant-derived compounds that are supplied to the pharmaceutical market from plant cell cultures technology, which means it's a very sustainable approach because you don't need to harvest the plant in the field. You basically get um, um, uh, non-differentiated cells in, in, in the lab, and you can uh, provide the stressing condition to boost the production of a target compound. For example, uh, scopolamine here is um, an alkaloid that has anti cholinergic effect, and it is used for this purpose, and it is sold as a drug coming from cell cultures of the boys species. Berberine is another alkaloid, and it is used as an antibiotic and an inflammatory, and comes from cell culture of Coptis, Japonica, and uh, Talictrum minus. Paclitaxel or Taxol, it comes from cell cultures of a taxis species and also from a semi-synthesis semi approach in which you get uh, a very abundant compound from the plant and you use this compound as a raw material for the production of the target compound. Uh, rosmarinic acid, a polyphenol, uh, from colios, bulmei, polysaccharides, um, shikonin, and geraniol, all of these basically for different uh, types of treatments. Or you can also use the whole plant technology. The whole plant technology is when you can regenerate a plant in the lab from non-differentiated cells. 
And then you can basically generate a plant which contains root systems and shoots and will uh, grow them under controlled conditions to get what you need. And as example, we have artemisinin that it is an antimalarial and is also using as a chemotherapy agent recently. And it is uh, uh, isolated from the Bosia uh, species. Uh, Captothecin, it's an alkaloid, is a chemotherapy uh, agent as well as vincristine, they are also uh, uh, obtained from whole plants generated in lab. And uh, a part of that, depending on the approach that we use to get the drug, we need to recognize the value and protecting our biodiversity because otherwise we don't have this anymore. And we need to make sure that we we'll have uh, the plant species for future uh, studies because uh, out of a plethora of uh, plant species worldwide distributed, uh, we know little about the flora, the world flora. And uh, if we don't take care of them, we don't have plant material in a sustainable way to study and get more uh, uh, medicinal compounds. Um, um, then this is important. And for example, um, the this, this plant, golden seal, uh, is uh, native to Canada and it is already on the sites list, which it is a list of a threatened plant. And uh, for example, for the health care for everybody, uh, the, the phytochemistry and the phytotherapy uh, is an approach that can really um, uh, favor the healthcare for all. Because throughout much of the world, herbal medicines are the foundation of healthcare, especially because of the cost. And then we just raise that question, can science improve healthcare as dispensed in its traditional manner? But how can you get this from lab bench to drugstore shelves? It's a long way. It's a long way, but we'll have uh, very successful examples and then we cannot give up. I mean, we need to be encouraged to do this because first of all, we need to uh, select the source material, the biomass. And here, of course, I will just uh, draw attention to plants. Once you have the biomass, you can do the extraction using a specific um, solvents to do that. And you get then a crude extract. You can do the determination of a biological activity of that crude extract. Also, you can do a separation in order to get fractions, more purified fractions that can be tested again for the biological activity. Then you can isolate the main uh, active compound to get a pure compound that can be tested. And then you get, once you get the identity of that compound, you get an active lead compound for further studies. The extraction method used basically are based on solvents and you can change the temperature to do that. Just making sure that depending on the natural product that you are dealing with, uh, you cannot rise the temperature because if you do this, the substance will be basically degraded. Then you can use a flowing or no flowing extraction approach. Once you get the crude extract, you get a complex mixture of uh, unknown compounds. And then um, uh, you basically need to do the separation of that mixture by different uh, uh, methods uh, uh, in, in physical or chemical properties to get it and then determine in vitro the activity. 
Uh, to separate and get more purified uh, fractions and even the, the pure compound, you have options like uh, distillation, crystallization, filtration, and chromatography to do that. As an example of a chromatography, we have here stationary phases that you can be used like paper, silicon, gel, and a mobile phase that you can use water and uh, organic solvents. Uh, for flash column chromatography, for example, or thin layer chromatography. Then you get an active compound that you still don't know the identity, and then you need to find out which one is the identity to pursue uh, further studies. Basically, you get the plant, the crude extract, pure compound, define the uh, is a molecular structure and the biological activity. But what is the time frame to successfully get a plant drug to the market? Basically, we start with uh, uh, preclinical testing in which you go to the lab, use animal models to do that because you want to assess safety and biological activity. This usually takes about one or two years to, to uh, perform and you get a success of 100% because you can test all the compounds, the, the, the interested compounds at once along, along this time. Then you move to the phase two, one, which it is basically when you get uh, 20 to 100 healthy uh, volunteers and you test very low doses of this uh, pure compound to determine safety and uh, the dosage. This can take about three years and um, uh, basically 70% of the investigation of new drugs will uh, go further. Okay, and for the phase two, you're going to get uh, um, about uh, 100 to 300 patients that will volunteer, and then you are going to keep going, evaluating the effectiveness and side effects, try, uh, try to find out the best doses uh, for that. And this will take around five to, uh, four to five years, and basically very optimistic, 33% of the investigation on new drugs will go further. And for the last phase, you get a uh, um, um, number of subjects higher because you needed to verify the effectiveness and monitor the various long-term use. And this can take up to six to eight years. And uh, 27% of the investigation on new drugs will potentially succeed. And what we know is basically out of 5,000 to 10,000 uh, compounds that enter in preclinical uh, pre tests, one is approved for market. It's a long way because we need to make sure to know the effective dose, the method of delivery, if it is um, oral or injection, and uh, the dosing interval as well. And then basically to finalize, I want to let you know that we have basically access to a book series about natural products chemistry of global plants that was edited by Dr. Raymond Cooper. And uh, we have several already uh, published that I think it's a good opportunity to those uh, who are interested in this uh, uh, um, era of research to pursue, because we have basically traditional herbs from Sri Lanka, West Bengal, uh, Brazilian medicinal plants, um, natural products for from uh, Silk Road plants, um, from Iran, from Borneo, from China, from Cameranian uh, 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 plants, um, from Ecuador, Laos, uh, Himalayas, and more recently, 
plants from Turkey. And this was just released in October of this year. And then I, I would recommend you all. Basically, we have a plethora of uh, substance from plants that we can take advantage of uh, a deep knowledge and research about them. And they can be basically used to treat several diseases and conditions. And then um, uh, the biodiversity is huge around the world. And I need to mention that Brazil holds them hugest basically uh, biodiversity that we need to protect to make sure that we have material to um, study for several years from now. And I want to invite you all who have the opportunity to come to Brazil to come for a visit to Belo Horizonte, the capital of Minas Gerais state. Here we have a very nice stadium here that uh, if you like a soccer, for example, come here and then we can watch a match. Uh, this green area here is the university, the Federal University of Minas Gerais State. And this is basically the campus uh, in which I work, okay? And I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Abdel and Sevilai for kindly inviting me to talk to you about this very, very uh, exciting um, subject, the Federal University of Minas Gerais and Ataturk University. Let me see if I can pronounce it. I, I, I tried, okay? Ataturk University. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Professor Modala. Uh, thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm just trying to get back to the screen. I'm not so familiar. I can see you all, but I I, I cannot really uh, stop sharing. Yes, I stop sharing. Uh, I'm trying, but I can't. Why do you say like stop sharing? It's, it's not appearing for me. Okay, got it. It's from uh, chair and then you stop. Yeah. It's not working. Okay, it's, it's no problem back with here. We have we have to have emotion always. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, that's okay. Lucia, uh, the, the audience they are happy with you, like, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, as usual, as you know, that's always I have questions like <laughs> as usual, like, as you know. Uh, <laughs> so now, Lucia, let's come to the point which is uh, plant food extracts versus the purified. So now from the practical point of view, because you know the process of isolating the purified com compound is very complicated and as you know, one of the cons is like very expensive. And uh, as you know, that's also like having the plant extract contain like a major, uh, so can I would say, contain the secondary metabolite or major metabolite as well as the minor metabolite. And as you know, that's the, the effect is not all, all the time is related to the major compound. Also exists that the main compound also should contribute to the effect. So from practical point of view, of view now, it's uh, what's your advice? Shall we take like the plant extract as it is uh, for using or we have to proceed uh, to the purified compound. For sure, purified compound, the dose is very, very small and it can produce the effect. On the other hand, having good extract, the dose will be like a bit higher, uh, but uh, uh, we can put like a, a good effect. So which one is like you recommend? Plant all extract versus like purified compound? Okay, thank you for your question. What if I tell you that I would recommend both? Because it depends on the situation. For example, um, 
uh, sometimes, uh, as for that Chinese uh, uh, um, mixture, it only will work if those four species are mixed in a particular uh, uh, percentage. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And they get a very good method of standardization in which you can basically commercialize that and, uh, and, uh, and get... Uh, um, um, a reliable source for uh, the treatment of the desired uh, uh, um, uh, disease, for example. And then for that purpose, I think if you just uh, try to uh, get the main compound, uh, not the main compound, the, the active uh, compound from each species, you may, may get uh, in the ocean, and uh, without knowing how to swim, because it's like uh, get a needle in the stack. And for this purpose, I would definitely recommend the phytotherapy for that purpose. Okay. And uh, especially because of the synergistic effect. And in the case that you have uh, um, a plant in which the main, the active compound is in a very low amount. Uh, but it is very effective, you still uh, use the plant may not be a good strategy because you are going to get a, a non-sustainable way to get this and and your, your resource will be gone in question of years yeah, because the population is just growing. And then for this case, if you are lucky to have... Um, uh, an active compound, which the structure is not so complicated, you can rely on organic synthesis as well. Uh, for example, taxol. Taxol is a good example. Taxol, the paclitaxel is a terpene that originally uh, extracted from the bark of um, taxol's brevifolia. Uh, you cannot technically do that because uh, it's gonna kill the plant. And uh, but if you go to the lab, the the synthetic approach they use currently uh, published, it takes nineteen steps to do that. And then in the end, you get uh, a very 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 pricey compound, and it is not feasible. And then we can rely on, for example, the cell culture which you can get a fraction of the plant, go to the lab and uh, undifferentiate those uh, cells. And then you get the stem cells from plants. And then you basically induce the production of a text out there and extract. And it's a good approach. Or semi-synthesis too, because you can get um, a substance that it is uh, produced in abundance in a plant. For example, in leaves, leaves are very, very um, uh, sustainable because a plant will go, grow and generate more leaves and it's not a big deal. Then you can extract from leaves and go to the lab. Uh, it is not my area of expertise, okay? But and then the organic synthetic uh, uh, scientists, they can just go further and do modifications and get the, the compound. Uh, overall, I would just recommend both approaches. I mean, traditional medicine will never die. We need to thank traditional medicine because all we know about the, the pharmaceutical drugs basically are from traditional medicine. And, and vice versa. Okay, I don't know if I replied. Uh, I yes, 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 yes. Yes, Lose also like the. Uh, uh, I have seen like most of the biological effects are related to anti-inflammatory and cancers. Like, but uh, is there any plant that can be used as antiviral? I have seen one of them is for against HIV, but not only HIV, but there is also like for example like now the era of. COVID and like influenza and uh, so on, like coronavirus. So is there any plant species that can be used also for, as an antiviral, like antiviral? Okay, yes, 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 we have. We have uh, uh, some species. It is basically in a book that we just published. I, I didn't mention about that because it was so a lot of information. I didn't want mm. to make people to get scared about my mm. talk. 
Mm. But we have uh, we we have published a, a book um, uh, in two thousand twenty two about uh, um, plant metabolites and uh, whole plants uh, to boost the um, the immune system. Mm. Okay, mm. and then we we have uh, several uh, species that are being already used for this purpose because they have uh, antivirus activity. But for example, for the case of HIV, um, uh, it is quite complicated, the treatment, because what it is suggested right now, you need to use several approaches, combine it, uh, because otherwise you cannot succeed because it is a very, very tricky virus. As for COVID, for example, um, Besides the natural products from plants, plants have been used as a platform for producing a vaccine against COVID. And uh, a vaccine against COVID produced in uh, plants uh, is a reality. There is a Canadian company called the Medicago uh, Incorporation. They used uh, tobacco plants they um, basically, by uh, metabolic approach uh, engineering, they introduced the gene that encode for a fraction of uh, um, a peptide from the, the coronavirus in order to get an antigen. And they, they basically produce this antigen in great amount in tobacco, they purified from the tobacco tissues and used an adjuvant from um, a, a pharmaceutical company that it is already widely used and elaborated a vaccine against the COVID. And basically in Canada, they are using, they are immunizing people with this vaccine. And it is a very, very uh, interesting approach because for example, when you think about producing the antigen uh, uh, in plants, uh, it is technically a safer way to get the purification because if the plant has some pathogen, it, the pathogen is not pathogenic to humans. And then the, the purification process and the, the chain of production gets uh, more feasible when you think about, for example, bacteria. Uh, currently, all the insulin, insulin is not from plant, okay? But uh, just for an example, all the insulin that it, it goes to the market comes from uh, Escherichia coli, uh, um, um, production. I mean, you produce the, ins the human insulin in uh, in the bacteria and then purify from that and get to us. And then this needs to be very well controlled because we don't want to get any contamination. And then uh, if you do a parallel with plants, plants is more feasible, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you mean like for antiviral, just like to enhance like or post poster or post the immunity? But it is not, it's not like, for example, like acting to prevent the virus from entering into the cells or prevent the release of the virus from the infected cells. Yes, uh, we have. We have several examples of compounds, especially saponins. They are very toxic and mm. in very low amount, they, they can. They can kill several viruses. But I think because we... we got uh, in a low guard with the COVID mm. and we still don't have uh, um, uh, substantial studies to support that, but people are working on that, okay, as a prevention and, uh, and also as a therapy as well. Thank you, Luzia, for, uh, for your time and for your presentation. presentation today and we are happy to have you like uh, our continuous medical education and we are looking forward to have you like next year again like uh, for another topic uh, which is interesting topic using the plant uh, extract or plant extract which is safer and also like it's application in, uh, in mm -hmm. medicine thank you Luzia, for your book and uh, looking for see you like yeah. uh, in person here or there or somewhere like yeah, thank you very much. And I hope I corresponded to, to the expectation, okay? Because uh, 
I, I, I thought of the audience being from undergrad to yes, uh, yes, grad yes. students and professionals. And then I tried to do something that I don't know. It, it's really hard when, when it's really um, a very vast audience. Yes, and yes. I wanted to, to tell that I am open to collaboration. If uh, anyone wants to talk and uh, you please uh, are free to give my contact. And uh, you are invited to come to Brazil, and then we can uh, talk about uh, science and uh, and culture as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much, Professor Modolo, for your beautiful presentation. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.